Hi everyone, it's a Friday night and I thought I'd go over one extra lecture just because I know some people, at least for my 2400 class, had some troubles, you know, programming uh, the assignment. And more importantly, every time I talked to somebody, it I got the sneaky feeling that it was the approach that was the problem. Not necessarily understanding, you might be understanding it just fine, but the approach can really get in the way when it comes to learning how to do this. And that's what I wanted to go over because I know from personal experience at least that when I have done things the wrong way, when I have coded and then tried to change a little bit, change a little bit, change a little bit, it has come and bitten, come back and bitten me. So here is, I was trying to find a good example. Surprisingly, I could not find a good example of a horribly made bookshelf because I wanted to use that as an example. Most things in life, when you're talking about a house, building, baking a cake, building a bookshelf that's coming from experience from me screwing that up you know putting together a barbecue uh some people don't like looking at instructions but that's not always the best plan and in fact it's a downright dumb plan to not look at the instructions especially when it comes to making it yourself you know you're supposed to measure twice cut once that's the the carpenter's code right you don't actually just sort of improvise it, wing it, or just, ah, oh, that's close enough, let's try this. It turns out terribly. That's what we're trying to really drill home here. It is plan, then plan, plan some more, then execute. There's a great link in line, I'm trying to remember it correctly. If I had four hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend three hours sharpening my ax. The just brute forcing it is not the solution. In fact, I've actually tried that actual thing. I tried to chop down, a, I think it was chopping down a tree or chopping down something with, with this old blunt uh, hatchet at my house. And I was whacking away at it. And it was like 20 minutes later, nothing. And I was like, you know what? I'm thinking Lincoln here. So I sharpened this hatchet and just like three swipes later, done. Right? It makes a difference, just the approach. So don't improvise like this house, actually plan. So this is what we're going to, I'm going to be going over a couple little things here. This is me doodling on, not technically paper, but pretty much paper, right? This is a paper tablet notebooky thing that I, I can doodle my notes on and I can actually save them for you guys. But that's about it. You want something that you can play with an idea that costs you nothing that you crumple up in a ball, throw away. That's where you design. You don't design with Visual Studio. You don't design with while well, programming up stuff. You doodle. Figure it out, then execute. It will hurt you otherwise. And it seems like it's a waste of time, much like stretching is a waste of time when you're exercising. No, you do it. Right? Warm-up exercises are not a waste of time. So here's what we're going to be talking about. For people in 1400, I'm going to share this video with you guys as well. First of all, I'm going to go over the code after this. But if you're in 1400, we're just going to talk about what's called a C string, a, a character string or character array. It's a bunch of characters, one after the other, and that's how we represent text. And so if you've, since you're in 2400, uh, the people that are in 2400, you've seen this before. I just have an array. It's just a whole bunch of characters, one after the other, all the way down the line. The task that I'm asking to do, let's see if I have the task here. I'll have to move it over to this side here. Here's my starter code. The task is to take something like this, just a text file, just a bunch of text. And what we're going to do is remove all of the comments. So if this is a comment, notice the double slash for a comment, or if I have something like this, a block comment, I'm removing all the comments from my text very much like what the compiler actually does. We're not actually doing what the compiler actually does, but that's what it has to do. Com compilers rip out and throw away all of your comments. The compiler doesn't need it, you need it as a person. People reviewing your code need it. So that's what the activity is. If I have this chunk of text, how do I break down this problem into a series of little tiny steps? Oh wait, that's algorithmic thinking, that's bit 1400. Oh wait, that's why I'm also sharing it with 1400 students. So let's get back to what we were talking about. Here is, and so I'm gonna go over how we're gonna break down the problem, how the different parts look, and how I would go about coding this thing, or how I did go about coding this thing. I will say, I didn't even follow my own advice perfectly, 
I did some stuff on paper. I didn't do enough on paper. Hit a bug in my code. Had to redesign again afterwards. Rather than just thinking it all the way through correctly. So, here's the idea. I have a text file with a whole bunch of comments that I want to remove from the text file. So if I have something like slash star comment star slash, that is a block comment. I got to get that out. So at the end, what I should have, so this is the text string that I have in the end. It, in memory, it looks like this. It's just a whole bunch of characters one after the other. If I do this, what I would expect when I remove, strip out the, the comments, I would expect the word hello, one space afterwards, and that's it. That comment block gets removed. If I have two slashes, I remove everything afterwards up to the end of the line. That's what a line comment does. So this would be my line comment. And so I need to figure out ways to remove all the comments from a text file. You pass me in a text file, out goes the comments, and all that's left is the, the stuff that's not commented out text. Okay. We have a bonus version of this question where instead of just outputting it to the screen, which is one of the ways of doing it, if you want the bonus, I think it's five points, maybe at most, you output it to a new text file. Not the same one, a new text file. Okay. So I've given a whole bunch of code on this, but I want to walk through my thing. So first of all, I get out the paper. That is step zero. That is before I even get going, I don't break out Visual Studio. I don't break out the code. I doodle. Afterwards, I got to understand the problem. So how do I want to approach it? How do I want to think through the problem? I'm just, there's no one way of doing it. So my way of doing it, the thoughts that came through my mind, but you can have a different thought. My thought on this was, I'm going to remove line after line after line. Why? Because if I try and remove everything as one gigantic string, first of all, it's going to take up a whole lot of space and I don't know where things are and it's going to be hard to keep track of. I want to do one string and one line of text at a time. That's my plan or at least. Okay. So that's where I'm going from, but you could do it as a big bulk thing. So I want to think of a bunch of examples next. So first plan of attack, I'm going to go remove each line of text. There's like pull, you know, read off each line of text, remove the comment part of that line of text and keep the rest and do that for every single line. And that'll get rid of all the comments, but I need to work through this a bit more. That's not good enough, right? That's just a rough, fuzzy watercolor version of things. So I want to go. So. I want some examples. So one example might be, okay, I have one double slash hello, then maybe a comment block is okay. And what would I expect that to do? I would expect after the double slash, the rest of the line is a comment. So everything gets removed, including the comment block inside of the comment, right? If you don't believe me, try it out in visual studio, type that line out and you will see one, just the number one, and the rest will be a comment. It'll be colored differently. Okay, example number two. What if I have, uh, I have the number two, then double slash, the opening, hello, and then the opening of a comment block, but not the stopping of it. Would I still be in a comment block? No, because I was never in one. The comment starts here and removes everything, including other comments inside of it. Right? I want to try out different things. What else could I do? I could put a block, two block comments down. I could put a block comment and a line comment inside of the block comment. I could put two line comments down. I want to play with what I want to doodle and figure out what the heck this should do in all possible scenarios that I can think of to make sure it works. So here's one other example. I have the two, I have the hello, I have the, that's the open ended one I said. Here's another one, three, a comment block. And then two tests, I would expect this comment block to be completely removed, but the three and the two tests to be left around. So three, two tests would be what I would expect as the output. If I had four, a comment block, a line comment, and the end of a comment block, I'd expect just the four. This entire block gets removed. And if it went on multiple lines like this next one, here's the start of the comment block, a bunch of stuff, still a bunch of stuff, still in the comment block. So this double slash is in the comment block. 
and even instill in the comment block. That entire thing, I expect to just be empty. It spans multiple lines, but it's still one comment. So my plan here is, what, what could I do? Well, first of all, I need to, if I end the line in a comment, I need to keep track of that. Uh, if I start one of these double slash comments, I can get rid of everything else in the line, but nothing afterwards. But if I'm in a comment block at the end of the line, I stay in the comment block on the next line until I get to one of those star slashes. Okay. I might want to play with some more stuff, but let's think about what we can do here. So I need a plan based on that pattern. I've looked at a bunch of patterns. I want to start coming up with a plan. So I'll try some things out. So what about if I, um, if I have two blocks, of, uh, uh, so what if I had a comment, a comment block, a double slash, and then another comment block? Well, what I would expect is everything up to here is removed and then everything after this is removed. What about if it was on multiple lines? Well, again, I would expect everything between here, uh, between here and here to be removed. Uh, no, here. And then I'd have a uh, star slash, right? So this ends here. This star slash has no stopping condition, so I'd get, in the end, I'd get just star slash. This last part here, because this matches up with this. Even if there's a slash star here, no, no, it's looking for the next star slash right here, the end of a comment block. Um, okay, so maybe I want to remove everything out in, in the block, just blindly remove everything in a block. Maybe I need to remove all the, the, the line comments first and then remove the blocks. Um, so why don't I start with a block comments, remove all the block comments, and then think about it and then go like, okay, now I'm gonna remove all the line comments. Well, that may not work because, well, let's have a look at this. So uh, if I have a line comment, it's found. So if I find the line comment and then I remove all the block comments afterwards, uh, what if the line comment is starting in the block? Well, that might be okay, I think. But if I have the line comments end of a block afterwards it's not is part so i do the double line i did the opening of a comment that it's not a legitimate opening of a comment it's inside the double slash the line comment okay what if i got rid of the line comment first well if i get rid of the line comment first then all the line comments first then if the block was in front of it it would inflect the line comment what I really need is to figure out which one comes first, then deal with it. And you find the next one and then deal with it. Find the next one, then deal with it. Whatever kind of comment we have over and over and over again, I just, I take one line and I get rid of the first line comment or block comment. And then I get rid of the next one and the next one until I'm done with my line. Okay. So I can't just remove all the block comments. I can't, and then remove the line comments. That's not gonna work either. Here would be an example, right? That block comment should not even be started. So I would get rid of this block comment, say, hey, I'm in a block, and you're not really. You're in a line comment. So if I'm in a block, I wanna finish it. If I'm not in a block, I find the first one of these things. I find out the first line comment or block comment, remove it, and then repeat, find the next one, find the next one, find the next one, until you're done with the line. And then I need to keep track of when I'm still in a block comment at the end of the line. So I just keep on removing comments until I get to the end of my line. And if I'm in a block comment at the end of the line, I have to, I have to know that for the next line. That's actually why we have this new data structure that I was talking about. So. Here's what the, the test, so here's what I would do. I might have something like this kind of test. This will test it, right? So if it's, I'm in a block comment, I finish off my block comment. If otherwise, I look for the next available thing. So here's what I would do. I'm in a block comment. The next line is, I'm in a block comment. I'm gonna keep on removing things until I get to my end of my block comment, right here. Once I get to the end of my block comment, I then look for my next 
comment, either line comment or a block comment. Oh, it's right here. Then I get rid of the rest of the line. So what I would get is I would expect way. Test this way test. So I expect the word way, just this one little part right here. So I remove until the end of my block comment. That gives me way double slash test. And then I remove the first line or block comment, which then gets me rid of everything else here. So it gives me way. And then I remove the next line or block comment. Oh, there's none. I, and I can stop. As soon as I don't have any more line comments or I'm at the end of the line, I stop. Okay. That's the approach. That's it. But now I need to break it into smaller chunks. So how do I get rid of a block comment? Uh, so how do I get rid of a block comment? I, if I'm in a block comment, I find the end of the block comment, the star slash, and then I move everything in the text after that over to where I am. So I take whatever I'm keeping and I bring it to the front to make sure that it stays in there. If I'm not in a block comment, I find the start of the block comment and then I find the end of the block comment and then I remove everything from the after the block comment to the front. Oh wait, that's the same thing. At some point in time, when as soon as I enter that block comment, I find the end, take the rest of the text, plop it up the front. So I will need something to shift all my text over. And I need something to find the end of a block comment. And I need something to find the start of a block comment. Okay, I write those things down, just doodle them down. I'm breaking down my problem into small little, little steps. How do I find, get rid of a line comment? I find where the line comment stops, uh, starts. Put a zero at the end. Uh, put a zero there instead of the line comment. Kills off all the other text. Done. <laughs> that that one's easier, right? All I need to do is find where the line comment stop uh, begins. If I know I'm, that's the first thing I'm, I'm trying to get rid of, and then I get rid of all the text after it because it'll clean off everything else in the line. There's no getting back out of a line comment. So once I find it, I just put a zero where that first slash is and I'm done. I like a slash zero. Okay, so how about let's write some pseudocode for removing the end of the block. So I'm gonna take from the starting position, I'm gonna move it to the end position where it's supposed to go. Well, really, I, the way I thought about this at least was, let's make it more general. What I want is I have a starting point and I have a destination point. It's going from here to here. So. I have a character in this position here. It's going to go right, uh, let's follow the lines. It's going to go into this position here. I have the next character in the, in the, so after this character, then it's this character. It's going to go one position later, one position later, one position later, just transfer them over. So shifting text, I'm going to call it shift text. I have some text. I have the starting position. I have the destination position. I want to make sure that the destination position is before the starting position, otherwise the math goes weird. I want to make sure the starting position is valid, it's not negative 17. The destination position is valid, it's not negative 17, or negative whatever. I need to make sure that the destination uh, position is, oh, it should be the other way, is, well, I want to check to see if that's the case. The destination position, where it's going to go, should be smaller than the starting position. I probably should have written less than, but it, I'm checking to see if it's greater than, blow up if it's greater than. Checking to see if the text itself, the array, is valid. Okay, that's all just bookkeeping and checking. Okay, what do we do? We move the character from the start to the destination. Then we increment the start and the destination. So instead of here, we do this, or the other way around, if you're depending if you're seeing this in mirror. And then we repeat steps five and six until I get to the end of the line. So I just go, boop, 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 all the way down until I'm at the end of my array. And that's it, right? I get to the last, the last character. I move that very last character over to the front, including that zero that stops my string, and then I'm done. So what I, this thing, by the way, this shift text, it should say the number of characters shifted. The number of characters, that, that's what it returns. The number of characters shifted is the length of the text minus the destination. That's how many characters I'm moving over, right? It's starting at that destination. The length of the string is you know, the length of the string is this long. 
but my starting point is here, so this is how many characters I moved over. Okay, how about removing a line? I find the line comment, test that the text is valid first. I find the line comment, I make the character at the line comment equal to, to zero, the end of the string, and say how many characters there are that I've removed. Characters removed is the original text minus the new text, the length of the new text. Great. So we will then, that's just me playing with values. Now comes the code. I haven't done any coding. Okay. I will actually do some of the, well, for the answer for assignment one, I might just record me doing that. It'll take well under an hour because I know what I want because I've, do I've doodled it out rather than spending 12 hours spinning your wheels, right? So what's the first thing I do? I write a, a bunch, I can write a whole bunch of functions, but they don't do squat. They are just the outlines. They are just what, you know, I'm gonna write a function called li remove line comment that does nothing. I'm gonna write a function called shift text that does nothing. I'm gonna write a comment that called whatever, like all of my different functions. They do nothing. They don't work on purpose. They compile. They don't work. I have the outline now. It's a table of contents. I have what this thing is supposed to do, but it doesn't do it yet. Okay. Next, I take a function that may be the simplest one I have. Implement it with comments to make sure I can understand it. I compile. Oh, sorry. So in between, step five, compile. Step six, implement the function. Step seven, compile. Just keep always compile. Don't try to write all your code at once. Do a little bit, check, do a little bit, check. So you compile it, see if it works. Write some tests to see if it works. So throw a string at this thing, see if it does what you expect it to. Compile some more. Write a couple more tests, compile some more. In fact, examine your tests, fix the code if it doesn't work as expected, compile again. Rinse and repeat until you can't think of anything else. That's what steps eight to, I guess, 12 here. We're looping steps eight, uh, eight to 11 until we think the code works. You should know the code works, but we don't really have a lot of time, that much time, right? You, good enough if it works and it does what you expect with a, with a bunch of inputs, with a bunch of different tests. So we write our function and then we test the hell out of it. We don't move on, we test the hell out of it because you want to be confident that it works. Because if it doesn't work, you will spend hours and hours and hours tracing down why it doesn't work. You'll find out, you know, three days later when you don't remember how your code works and you'll spend five hours trying to figure out why the hell it doesn't work. If you write your test now, it's fresh in your memory, you get it, it's polished, it works, you're confident it works. Okay. Step 13, loop, steps 6 to 12. Write another function. Make sure, it with comments, write, uh, compile it, write some tests, compile it, check to make it works, refine it. It's a loop inside of, uh, this is a big loop and there's a loop inside of that loop. Until I run out of functions. That's it. But if you write all of your code and then go compile, let's see what happens. You will spend days working on this stuff and you will not, you'll just spin your wheels a little bit at a time, test it. These tests don't have to be crazy. They just have to be enough that you're pretty damn confident it works. And then afterwards, test your code with different inputs and make a new text file, for example, right? Then you submit your code on time and then you mock for the other students that don't get it done on time because they didn't do it the right way. Right? I'm not going to mock them, but go right ahead and mock them. Right? If you're doing it the right way, it should not be that painful. A little bit at a time, you'll get two error messages. You look at them and go like, what's that caused by? You figure it out. It doesn't take you hardly any time to do that. You get 200 error messages, you're there for the evening. Little bit at a time. You don't throw it all at once. You don't do a turkey dinner, like a Thanksgiving dinner, by throwing all the dishes on, you know, in the stove and all of this, all at the same time, you do one dish, you move on to the next, you do another dish, you do it, and you follow step by step. Okay, I wanted the whole reason for this, for in case 1400 students were completely confused why I'm providing that video. 
This is pseudocode. This is algorithmic thinking. This is actually potentially not this question exactly, but the kind of thing we're looking for for the exam and for the course in general. How do you figure out the problem? You break it down into little steps. Oh, wait, I have a step by step analysis of how you do a task. In this case, writing code algorithmically laid out, including with a loop. We have algorithmic thinking. Talk about algorithmic thinking. Yeah, how meta, right? This is what we do. And this is also what everyone does, even if they don't admit to it. They're doodling crap on paper constantly for whatever thing that they're doing. Oh, this is a to-do list, I guess. But I went through giant notebooks. Everyone I know who's a programmer goes through giant notebooks, just doodling out the idea before they code. Nobody dives into code. You think, then code. Or you will be in a lot of pain. It just, everybody does it for a reason. Because we know how painful it is if you're in the thick of the code and you, you're, you can't see the forest for the trees. Have a plan, have a map, right? Know which way you're going through the forest before you go into the forest. You don't just wildly walk around in the trees. You get the Blair Witch Project in that case, right? Okay, I'm going to stop there. Everyone of 2400, you'll see me go over the actual code itself now, but I wanted to point out the algorithm that we're using to test our code and to go through everything. And 1400, I wanted to point out where it gets used and that it's everywhere every time you you code or when you think about troubleshooting a network or you think about how you're going to uh, design an interface or whatever the case you're doing every single part of the uh, CSIT program every single part of it involves some kind of methodical algorithmic thought process on how to design or to test things okay I'll even, I can even do a video on how to debug as well, but we also talk about that in the lectures. Okay, I'm going to stop it there, and 2400, hopefully you'll see me very soon. Thanks. Uh, over here. Oh, there we go.